All right. Hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And with me today, I'm excited to have Adam Lindsay. Adam is the founder and managing partner of Pal Anderson Capital Partners. Adam, how's it going? Great, Andrew. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, thanks for coming on. I'm excited to have you on as well. And let me transition with that to start this podcast the way I do every podcast. That's by pitching you, my guest. You and I first started swapping notes, I think, on the Warner Discovery deal when that got announced, which is a super interesting deal. I thought we were sharing some pretty good notes there. But so I, I was really excited to have you on. And then you got pitched to me by one of the people's favorite podcast guests, uh, Randy Barron, who pitched Amorous a few weeks ago. So the combination of a smart guy I'm swatching, swapping thoughts with on Discovery plus Randy's endorsement that just had to have you on. So really excited to have you on. And that out the way, let's just transition right over to what we want to talk about. You know, this is in the John Malone universe, which longtime listeners and readers will know I love. This is your idea is kind of buying Liberty TripAdvisor, but it's really centered on TripAdvisor, the company, and then Liberty TripAdvisor gives you some up the side. So we'll focus TripAdvisor and then we'll maybe transition to Liberty TripAdvisor at the end. So I'll toss it over to you. Why is now the time to buy TripAdvisor? Great. Well, th thanks, Andrew. I, I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, you know, fan of the podcast. I feel like there's been a lot of you know, a lot of useful uh, things I've learned from the podcast and the, and the blog. So hopefully this is a chance to give back maybe just a little bit. Hey, I, um, I appreciate that. And I do. And I appreciate you mentioning Randy too, because he helped encourage me uh, to, to take the jump um, and, and uh, go on the record here, at least a little bit. Full disclosure, none of this is investment advice, right? Absolutely. People should do their own work here. Um, you know, personally, I, I have you know, via my partnership, a decent slug of my net worth is invested in Liberty TripAdvisor. So I have a view and, uh, but always looking for disproving evidence. So I welcome the conversation. And if, you know, I'd love the feedback, if people listening uh, have a materially different view, I'd, I'd welcome it and, and like to hear it. So on the TripAdvisor, like you said, you know, people kind of have a sense of what that is, five-ish billion dollar enterprise value advertising company in the travel space. Liberty TripAdvisor, separately publicly traded company, has about a you know twenty percent economic interest, sixty percent uh, the vote of TripAdvisor. So it's got kind of a billionish dollars of TripAdvisor stock, and then you know seven hundred million dollars of complicated Liberty style debt, and you know so a, you know there's a nav there of three or four hundred million, four hundred million bucks almost trades for less than three hundred million bucks. So there's a discount there. Um, the other thing to note. Liberty TripAdvisor is controlled by Greg Maffei, not uh, John Malone. And, you know, it's unclear to me, Malone may be long gone here, right? Like, uh, so, um, you know, this, uh, and, and let's, that gets into, so when you think about the thesis, I'd say there's kind of four points. Number one is, you know, we're here on the yet another value blog. So we're supposed to be looking for, you know, things that are unloved and, and, you know, these guys are that, right? Like TripAdvisor has been a real stinker as a public stock since, you know, for seven, eight years, almost since it spun out. Liberty TripAdvisor has been an unmitigated disaster down like 90% from when it spun out of ventures, which is a real case study in the dangers of margin. And uh, so it, so that's number one. Number two, you know, then there may be reasons for that, but uh, at least we, we do, we, we, we know we're not hunting in something that's terribly popular. Number two is online travel is a great sandbox to play in. And you only have to look at, say, you know, the last 15, 20 years at booking.com to, to really as a case study to understand that. TripAdvisor has always had, continues to have a unique position in that ecosystem that they've sort of never been able to monetize. But it's still a good sandbox to play in. Number three is the fundamentals of TripAdvisor, the, where they get their revenue and who their customers are, what they pay to Google, where their cash flows come from. It, it's really changed over the last two, three years. And it looks, you know, it's, it's meaningfully different from where it was three, five years ago. So if you haven't taken a look in a while, you know, you, you could debate whether or not it matters that it's changed, right? But, um, but it is, it does look different. And then, um, and then the fourth, and this is the reason why we're here today, kind of to the point you brought up, is COVID really has created this opportunity for them to reset the, the business model and push on this TripAdvisor Plus. And, and really, I think they're re-architecting the entire business model towards TripAdvisor Plus and a direct-to-consumer offering. And you know, the reason to your point, like, why isn't this just instant book 
2.0 um, is what's different here than all the other efforts to improve the monetization is there's real industrial logic to this uh, subscription product. Um, there's a real value proposition for the consumer because essentially the consumer gets hotel rooms at wholesale cost. There's proposition for TripAdvisor because they get the 99 bucks a year subscription fee. And then even for the hotels, it's good because it's a cheaper source of distribution for them than say the OTAs or some of their other channels and they get all the consumer data. So there's a real argument to be made that this is logical and, and then TripAdvisor because of its spot in the ecosystem is uniquely positioned to profit. And so then if that's true, right, the, the, the big dream here is pretty easy to see, right? They've got 400 million uniques, you convert two, 3% of those, you know, that's 10 million subscribers at a hundred bucks a year in sort of a Costco type model where we pass you goods at wholesale prices. We, you know, our earnings are basically the subscription and, you know, that's a billion dollars right there on a company that's, you know, had a hard time doing three, 400 million bucks in EBITDA. So that's kind of the, so it's easy to see the big dream and you know, three, five years out. So that's kind of the headline. I welcome, you know, let's dig in. No. We have questions. That was great. I'm going to have to really earn my, my hosting money here because you just went through like 95% of the questions I had there, but I think I can earn my hosting money that, here. That's okay. Let's start. So the big initiative, I think the big thing that gets you excited, that gets me excited, to be honest, is the TripAdvisor Plus program. And the first thing, and you addressed this a little bit, so we don't have to dive too hard in, but every person who asks questions on this, including when you first talked to me about this, my first question, every analyst asked this question, every person who heard about the podcast asked this question is, why is this not instant booking 2.0? So, because three, four, five years ago, people got very excited about instant booking 2.0. And it was a flat out, I don't want to say disaster, but pretty much a disaster, I'd say. So maybe you could start by giving an overview of what instant booking was Sure. a little bit more on the TripAdvisor plus model and why. And I think they've laid it out nicely. I think you started to lay it out nicely there. Why the TripAdvisor plus model makes more sense than instant booking. The one thing I want to step back that I think is important table stakes in all discussions about online travel is to realize, you know, and what makes online travel a special niche to operate in is these are fixed cost businesses. You got to buy planes, you got to buy hotels, you got to buy ATVs and zip lines, like whatever it is, it's a fixed cost business and there's no long-term constraint on supply. There's always another hotel down the beach in Cancun. There's always, you know, a, you know, a block away from the plaza. There's a mid-block hotel that goes up. So there's, so you have this super fragmented supplier base that is in a fixed cost position. So they're very willing, you know, if you, Andrew, could like sell hotel reservations on yet another value blog, right? These hotels would pay you a 20% per night commission, right? To put a head in a bed. And that's a really big nut. If you think about, you know, room nights, 100, 200, 300 bucks, 20% a night, it's a really big nut. So that is just the important thing, the background to understand about kind of all of online travel. So instant book, you know, was a strategic mistake. And I think the most important thing to realize is at the time, Expedia and booking were 50% of TripAdvisor's revenue. And then TripAdvisor basically said, we're going to try and go over the top of you and take those customers for ourselves. And, um, and then to the customers, they said, hey, this will be great. You won't have to click off our website and, uh, you know, we'll take the credit card and we'll store your information forever. And, and isn't that awesome? And the customers said, no, that's not awesome. Like, I don't want to transact on TripAdvisor. Like, TripAdvisor is a magazine. Like, there's no real benefit for me to transact on TripAdvisor. And there's no, the price is the same, right? The price is the same. Adam, so, can, I, can I just hammer that point home just a little bit more? So yeah. TripAdvisor, the way they generally make most of their money comes from, you said Expedia is 50%. What happens was, is, was, 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 you look up a, you, I want a hotel in New Orleans and they present a list of hotels on TripAdvisor. And what would actually happen is you would click it and you would go off site and book it on Expedia. Right. And you Expedia end up on would, Expedia. Expedia would pay them for the click or whoever would pay them for the clip. Right. And in instant booking, you just wouldn't go off site. They kind of cut out the, they're the middleman. They kind of cut out the end person and became the end person. But I just want to make sure we drive that home exactly what it's the right. Thing. And then, the, but they still needed trip. Tripadvisor still needed the hotel, the OTAs, 
Expedia and, and Booking for supply. And so then they had to architect the product in such a way that, you know, they were happy to provide it. And, and it just, it didn't, it didn't provide any benefit for the consumer. And, and the, the other piece of, and, and that's really important to understand here is there's these two principles in, in online, really in, in most commerce, but in, in hotels and online travel, it's called resale price maintenance and rate parity. And what this means is a hotel can determine and has the right to dictate the pricing that gets advertised publicly out there. Right? So the dirty little secret among all the OTAs and the hotels or whatever is nobody gets a deal. Right. Like if you and you could do this test yourself, if you you know try and get the exact room with the exact amenities in the exact times at the exact same hotel and you do it on the hotel's website and on booking, you're never you're never going to see that different of a price. You're very rarely. And if you do like and you click all the way through some of you don't end up getting it. Right. That's this. this it's kind of like MSRP. And so and that, that's what's out in the public universe. And that was what, you know, and so Instant Book had to operate like that. So they'd show people, you know, three different prices and they were all the same. You could book it on Instant Book or you go over to Booking or you go over. And so it, there was just no consumer benefit. TripAdvisor Plus, because you pay the 99 bucks up front, you're behind, you know, what the, you know, a paywall or a hard. And, and, and this is what, were, what really caught my eye is, you know, about five, seven years ago in Europe, there, there became real antitrust issues. And it was a real concern for booking because there were a number of small companies that were sort of offering these wholesale rates out there. Um, and, and they were saying it was anti-competitive that the hotels told them they couldn't do it. And in the U.S., it's kind of established that you can do this behind a paywall or on your own website, you know, if you're, you know, in your own members program. But in Europe, it was less established. And the way they wrote out the law is, it, or the regulations, is it has to be behind one of these affinity groups or one of these affinity paywalls. And so what's different here is the consumer there, you know, TripAdvisor is going out, there's a whole network of wholesale suppliers, these bed banks, TripAdvisor's tapped into that, they buy those hotel rooms at wholesale prices, you know, 10, 15, 20% discounts, and they're passing it along, but they can advertise those to you once you've paid the 99 bucks and once you're behind the login, you know, and so until that happens, they just say, hey, you're looking at this hotel, you know, most people save 350 bucks if they book this hotel, you should pay 100 bucks, come behind our paywall and see. And so for us, it, and it's not going to be for every consumer, right? And particularly initially, but for a certain kind of savvy consumer who wants to, you know, who's, you know, travels a decent amount, and they sort of understand that they never get a deal anywhere, it's going to be very attractive. I agree. And I just want to make sure we're getting this right because TripAdvisor says we want this to be a win, 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 right? And it's a win for TripAdvisor if you sign up for TripAdvisor Pro because they get that sweet, sweet Costco membership revenue, right? $100 per year. Yes. It's a win for the consumer because I think TripAdvisor said, hey, we target consumers who are about to go on a $750 trip. You get 15% off $750. That more than covers the price of your first year of membership on that trip. Right. And the question to me, and I, they explained it, but I, I'd like you to explain it a little further, is how does the hotel win, right? Obviously they're right. getting people, but right. they're giving TripAdvisor a discount on this rate versus Expedia and everything. So why is this a win for the hotel? Right, well, and so the other part is it's a win, 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 but it's not a win, 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 right? So in theory, hopefully they're, they're gonna take some of the, you know, stuffing out of, you know, you know, Google and then maybe to a lesser extent, the OTAs, but I think that's kind of a longer tail situation. The reason it makes sense for the hotels, right? If I'm a hotel today, um, you know, I, I have various forms of distribution depending on the kind of hotel I am, right? So obviously, as much as I can get to my own website, that's awesome, right? This is why Marriott buys Starwood, you know, for all those Starwood Points members. And they want to, you know, you know, for those consumers that are loyal, they want as many of those as possible. Then, you know, there's the, the other big bucket is going to be basically the OTAs, particularly for leisure travel, Expedia and booking, and then the, kind of a long tail of smaller guys. You know, that, that's another channel of distribution. There's, there, you know, there's a couple others. The other, you know, sizable one, and it depends on the hotel, it might be 15 to 25%, is wholesale, where they go to these bed banks and those guys commit the capital and they put it and, and then, you know, it gets sold in an opaque market, like the old price line, name your own price or different things like that. So, and as a hotel, I, I don't want just one source of distribution, right? Because maybe we have a bad season. If I'd sold some rooms up front, I'd be better off. Then every hotel is going to come to their own determination on that. 
but for that big slug of their business that is Expedia and booking, right? Expedia and booking own the customer. They don't tell you, right? They don't, they, you know, they get a name. That hotel gets a, like, you should, you know, next time you go and you book, ask them to show you the screen. And, uh, you know, they get your name and they know you came from Expedia. And they don't even know if you came from Hotwire or Hotels.com or whatever. They just, that's all they know. And then they'll try really hard to market you, get you to sign up for their, but they don't even know who you are. And they paid, you know, book, you know, Expedia, you know, 18% or 20%, whatever the commission was. TripAdvisor goes to them, you know, in, in the in the big dream where TripAdvisor develops direct relationships with the hotels, TripAdvisor goes to them and says, hey, don't pay, you know, don't pay 20% and get zero information, pay us 15% and we'll give you all the information. We'll give you their email, their address, give them a great experience, try and get them to sign up to your loyalty point, like try and, you know, turn them into a lifetime customer, right? And so for the hotel, to the extent there's enough volume to make it worth their time, you know, it's, it's not worse than, than the, you know, it's, it's better than the OTAs. So that, that's the value proposition for them. And I get that brings us nicely into my, into the next question. And I think people have been asking, people have been asking this, Hey, the OTA shut down, basically shut down instant booking in the last time because they hated it. And the big question here is, yes, this is going to start small, but aren't the OTAs going to stop giving you stop giving you traffic once they look at this and say, they say, hey, you're getting cheaper prices, you're going direct, you're end running around us. We can't give you things, we can't give you any more of our supply because you're gonna cannibalize our business at some point. Right, well, so, and and this is what gets so interesting, right? Because um, first of all, when Instant Book happened, like I said, Expedia and, and booking were 45, 50% of revenue. So what we haven't talked about yet is TripAdvisor bought this business called Viator which is the, a travel, uh, like an experiences business, right? So you have heads in beds, you got, you know, butts in, in airline seats, and now you've got like butts in ATV, you know, on ATVs and, and in zip lines, right? And, and TripAdvisor is, I think, the largest in the Western world on this, you know, they're really an OTA for these experiences. So tours, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff super fragmented, fixed costs. There's a lot of nice attributes about that business. It was growing, you know, pre-COVID is growing you know, well north of 20%. The commission rates, you know, you know, a guy who owns 10 ATVs and his or bikes or whatever, and is trying to like, um, you know, sell those online. He has a lot less leverage than a hotel chain. So the commission rates should actually be, you know, kind of similar, at least to the long tail of hotels. So that's a pretty good business to be in. That's that experiences and dining is now 30% of TripAdvisor revenue, right? The um, And then, you know, partially because of COVID, Expedia and Booking have dropped all the way down to 20% of revenue in 2020, right? So from 50 to 20. So 50, they could dictate. 20, you know, nothing's worked. Maybe TripAdvisor can just tell them to pound sand, right? Like, so it's a different, it's a totally different negotiating position. That's, that's number one. Um, the second is, you know, it's the... With Instant Book, they didn't, you know, they kind of threatened to not come on. They threatened to not come on parts of it. They eventually sort of got there. They they got to a place where um, TripAdvisor would display, so you knew you were booking on Priceline.com or whatever, and um, and you know it effectively made the product not very you know monetization friendly for TripAdvisor, and it was sort of not any worse for the OTAs. Um, but in you know, so in this case. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's just not what's on offer here, right? Like TripAdvisor is giving them something totally different. So I guess to reset, you know, on your question, you know, why won't the OTAs just, you know, pull away? It's, well, first, they're a much lower percentage of revenue now. So they have much less power. The, the other thing, and, and this may be more important, where are they going to go, right? So like the Bain, and this is the other key, key point of online travel, Google and the Google tax, that's the bane of everybody in the, the travel ecosystem, right? And so, um, you know, you know, booking is the best in the world at arbitraging a click to a head and a bed, like a Google click to a head and a bed. They're the best in the world. If you go look, they give you pretty good information. They pay, you know, 30% of their kind of net revenues go straight to direct advertising, which is mostly Google, right? So, and they're the best of the world. For Expedia, it's more like 50%. Right. And for, you know, you know, a European OTA or, you know, air, it might be 60 or 70 percent. 
right? So, so if I'm, if I'm booking and I'm slowly like, you know, getting boiled like a frog by Google, do I really, even if I only get 10% of my traffic from TripAdvisor, do I really want to kill them off? Right. Do I, you know, I always, you know, to some extent, you know, they want some, you know, they're, they're going to go, you know, until the ROIs, if, if the ROIs were to get, you know, you know, meaningfully worse. Here's the other reason why I think that's not, uh, or it doesn't concern me too much if you think about it. So booking and, you know, I would love it if it cannibalized, if they said, you know, if TripAdvisor got so many um, subscribers that they, that uh, booking and Expedia, you know, pulled off the platform, that would be awesome, right? Because today, you know, and I don't have perfect numbers, but you can think about it from a high level, you know, best case, you know, if somebody say like a good customer 10 times a year, if you look at the averages, booking gives, you know, is a pretty clean, um, you know, that, that those average hotel room nights are 100, 130 bucks. Booking, you know, makes $20-ish or something like that on their commission. And, you know, that Google tax is six bucks, right? So, so and, you know, TripAdvisor maybe isn't even that six, right? Maybe they're much less of that. And so, so you know, if a good customer is 10 nights a year, you know, for booking that customer's worth 200 or, you know, maybe they're staying in nicer hotels, so they're 300 bucks a year. But for TripAdvisor, that customer is, you know, I think it's probably worth, you know, 30, 50 bucks max, right? So, so cannibalization to me is great because if I'm TripAdvisor, I'm taking a customer that was worth 30 bucks a year to me and I'm turning them into a customer that's worth a hundred bucks a year to me and booking, you know, they're kind of in a tough, I mean, it's so small that it's not going to matter. Right. And they can, they're just going to, you know, they're smart capital allocators and they're just going to like run this thing, you know, for another decade or two and, you know, run it for cash and do smart things with that cash. Like they did before when they stopped, you know, they, they saw that, the name your own price business only had a limited, you know, market. And then they made the greatest acquisition ever when they bought, you know, booking and the other business and put them together. Right. So they will do fine. And I think the, the reality is, is it takes so little to move the needle for TripAdvisor in the grand scheme of things. You know, I, you know, we haven't heard anything yet. You know, I, I had the same reaction when they first came out. I thought, holy cow, they're going, you know, you're, this is going to be war. Right, like TripAdvisor or Booking and Expedia are just going to come out, and, and so far it's been crickets. They haven't said a thing, right? And so we'll see, we'll see, but uh, and that could still happen. But so far, um, it hasn't. Let me ask you a, a question on the different side of the risk, right? So let's say Expedia and Booking don't respond by taking supply off of TripAdvisor, but I think the next most natural question will be: Well, Booking and Expedia have more relationship, ha already have the direct relationships with the hotels. They already have customer credit card information, all that type of stuff, great data. So I think the next question would be: Well, if this starts getting some traction for TripAdvisor, why wouldn't Expedia and Booking, or if you wanted to go real crazy, Google, roll out a membership? like this, when they see the value, they see the, they see the value prop, they see all the consumers sign up for it. They could roll out a membership like this and kind of kill sure. TripAdvisor before they really got the flywheel going. Sure. So Google is the easy one to get rid of, you know, Google. And I think they understand this. They are in the advertising business, right? And even yeah, in yeah, online yeah. travel, you know, that's been a, a bugaboo forever is that Google is just going to come and take it all. And it's like, no, like that, that, you know, what, what booking does, those direct connections, those hotels, that takes a long time. There's a lot of, there's a totally different skill set in being a transactions business versus being in an advertising business. Right. And so, and I think Google understands that. So I don't think they're going to offer a subscription. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe Amazon would, but wouldn't they just buy TripAdvisor? Right. I don't know. Um, so uh, I think I, that makes me less concerned. It, it's a valid point. Like, you know, shouldn't Expedia and Booking just do this? But they can't. To that point I said earlier, if you think about what is a good customer worth to Booking on an annual basis, and I don't know if it's, you know, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever it is, you know, that customer, you know, unless, unless the universe, you know, unless there's only like a million customers at, at, at TripAdvisor that actually matter and they're all the most valuable customers in the universe, right? Like there's no way TripAdvisor makes more money on a customer than booking does, right? Like best case, they make a third, right? So booking can't do it, right? Because they take a customer that was worth 300, 300 bucks a year, and they say, well, we'll take you for a hundred bucks a year. I mean, that would destroy, I mean, you know, there's, you know, I, I've, I've talked to people who say like, I would love that if booking would do that, you know, but I mean, I think, I think it's a long shot, right? Because they're, they're in the innovator's dilemma there. 
I, I was going to say, so if I could summarize what you're saying, they're in the innovator's dilemma. They're almost too profitable to roll off yeah. the subscription product that would be highly valuable, but would cannibalize so much of their core right. business. Because because it, really what this is, the subscription product is a, a wholesale distribution channel, right? And and um, and that's just, they're not in the wholesale distribution business, right? They're in the retail business. Let's talk about, we, we've talked about some of the risks and I've got a couple more we'll come back to, but let's talk about some of the upsides. Let's have a little bit more fun. And the two upsides I want to talk about, which kind of do connect, but you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, when we talk TripAdvisor, you think trips and a lot of times you, th you think hotels, flights, that type of stuff. But I think the real jewel for TripAdvisor is the experience side of the business. Right. So yeah. I want to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about the flywheel that they could get going once they get the subscriptions going. So why don't we start with the experiences and we can flip over to the flywheel if we don't address during the experiences. Yeah, I mean, so, and again, that in, to some extent, you know, I always look at this, my old boss used to talk about risk reward, uh, you know, ups, you know, probabilities, right? And and when I think about my, my downside risks here, one of the things I really like is that experiences business. I mean, anybody who digs under the covers you're like, holy cow, these are going to, you know, TripAdvisor, oh, you know, if if hotels is a global duopoly in OTAs, you know, you know it appears, at least in the Western world, um, experiences, booking these experiences is, you know, going to be a duopoly or maybe maybe it'll be three players, right? There's there's Viator TripAdvisor, there's, uh, I think it's called Get Your Guide, and there's a thing called Kluke, K-L-O-O-K, -K and mo mostly Asia-focused, um, like those uh, and, and so that's a great place to be. We already know if you can be in an OTA in a super diversified market, like that's a great business. And so you, you could, you know, there's a big dream right there with that, that business. I mean, it, I think in 19, it had $450 million of revenue it was growing north of 20%. So you say line of sight, a couple of years, you know, where could that be, you know, five, $600 million. Um, you know, if we were to willing to believe that it should have good OTA economics, you know, EBITDA margins there would be, you know, 25%, you know, they could be very high. Um, you know, you could, you know, you, you fund with multiples and you come with a real healthy valuation there. The private companies are unicorns in the private market. Um, so, you know, right. You know, it, it, it's hard to do with some of the parts for TripAdvisor um, because you really can't, you know, cause that review and that, 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 that kind of travel attention acquisition model um is uh, is you know doesn't travel if you set if you separate the parts, but if you just for the intellectual interest and uh, uh, you know exercise did it, you know I don't think it's too hard to say that business today would be worth I don't know two or three billion dollars, right? Uh, in, you know in a, in a non downside scenario. I, I hear you, and I'll just add a little bit, and this will help transition us to flywheel. But the thing I love so. Anyone who's read the blog, I don't think I talk, I've talked about this much on the podcast, but I love escape rooms. And a couple of years ago, I got kind of bullish on Yelp. And one of the things oh, I would escape always, rooms. Okay. love yeah. escape rooms. <laughs> Every podcast no, no, no. Gets, gets an escape crate present. So you'll be getting that in a couple of days. But, oh, wow. Yeah. But I, I hate to spoil the surprise there, but I love escape rooms. And a couple of years ago, I was getting pretty bullish on Yelp. And one of the things I was thinking was whenever I would go to an escape room, none of them would ask for a Yelp review. All of them would ask for a TripAdvisor review. And that's because right. Yelp had it ingrained. You do it for local stuff. But TripAdvisor... Yeah. Everyone, they, they knew their core business was people who were traveling and everyone knew TripAdvisor is how they do it. When I went to Asia for my honeymoon, every place would ask for TripAdvisor reviews. It's just such a great network where people who are traveling go to TripAdvisor to look up local experiences. So local experiences want to get TripAdvisor reviews. And there is a very natural, it's difficult, but there is a very natural, if TripAdvisor can go to those local places, get them to get direct bookings on TripAdvisor. I mean, that is an incredibly potentially powerful and valuable thing with a massive moat because you have to go literally local company by local company. And as you said, these is it's a local escape room that owns one escape room. It's not Marriott, so they don't exactly have a lot of pricing power to push right. back on your commissions. Right. No, I think that, that's exactly right. And then, and and you know, to to your point about the the flywheel, I think a big component, and I, I mentioned this a little, is you know this the importance of the Google tax here, right? So the, the thing I didn't mention or that we didn't get to yet is TripAdvisor. If you look when they were doing the instant book. They uh, they were paying 40, 45 percent of revenue straight to Google. Right. Because they were and, and they were terrible at it. Right. Like they're, you know, they, you know, booking 
could take that click and convert it so much more efficiently into a head and a bed than TripAdvisor could. And so, and, and, you know, they tried it for a couple of years and it didn't work and they quit and they stopped doing it. And they said, mea culpa, they said, we did the wrong thing. And they said, we're going to run this thing for cash. Right. And you can see it in like the numbers in 18 and 19 and they, and then, and then in 20, and it's just gone down, 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 down. Whereas last year it was like 20 ish percent of revenue went to Google, right? They just said, look, we're going to run this thing for cash. We're, and, and, and because they're TripAdvisor, because people just, you know, end up there, right? If, if Google isn't totally evil, right? And I'm searching around the internet, I'm eventually going to end up, you know, I'm planning my travel. I'm eventually going to end up on TripAdvisor. Um, so what that, you know, and that's again, versus, you know, that Google tax is like 30% for booking, 50% for uh, uh, Expedia. And so TripAdvisor is kind of has this low cost position in acquiring travel intent, uh, intention, right? And so then, and then to me, that's like the biggest piece of the flywheel. You're just getting them into the ecosystem, right? Then, you know, do they do a, an experience? Do they do a hotel? Do they become a TripAdvisor Plus member? And then, and then, and then that TripAdvisor Plus, like we, we see, you know, the benefits, you know, if it's Netflix or if it's Amazon, you know, every business now that, you know, nobody launches a business with a third party, right? You launch on Shopify, right? Like everybody's trying to go direct. And then there's certain flywheel if you can like continue to add value. So I think an important part of that, besides just adding, you know, more experiences, more hotel rooms, is that that, you know, that acquisition, um, you know, you know, ability should give them, and that's the piece that makes TripAdvisor uniquely able to do this. Now, it's not a guarantee, right, that it's going to work, and and you know, maybe people just don't want to book anything on TripAdvisor, right? They just want to like go there to read reviews. But um, you know, there's a lot of indications that it is getting traction. Yeah, and if I could add on to that, I I think TripAdvisor Plus adds another component to that flywheel because. If somebody goes there once and they save, you know, as we said, they try to save you more than the annual subscription price on your first booking. But then the next time you go, you're going to go book through them because it's going to be cheaper to book on TripAdvisor than to go anywhere else because they're giving you that discount. So they should get people kind of ingrained where when we travel, we go to TripAdvisor, we book our hotels there because we'll save money. We book our experiences because we're already on there and we'll probably save money because TripAdvisor can pass through some of that commission cost to us. So I think you just get a great flywheel going where once you get someone in, all of a sudden they're redirecting more and more of your their right. spend to you. TripAdvisor doesn't have to reacquire them through Google marketing every time. So I just think there's a really powerful potential flywheel there. I mean, and that's the big dream, right? This becomes the Costco of like online travel. Like people just, you know, they, they view themselves as Costco members, right? People start to view themselves as TripAdvisor members and yeah, they don't get all the selection, right? You don't get everything in the universe, but you get some great stuff and, you know, you sort of upscale your experience relative to what you would have otherwise. Yep. Let's turn to another risk. So I, I actually think this is the biggest risk and it very much relates to the instant booking risk we talked about earlier, but Steve, it's Coffer. Steve Coffer is the yeah. CEO, co-founder, yeah. co-founded yeah. it around 2000, 2001, co-founder right. TripAdvisor. And I do think there's a question, look, it, Instant Book wasn't great. This <laughs> The stock's been flat for 10 years. I love the vision they're rolling out for TripAdvisor Plus, but it's the same team that launched, again, launched Instant Book. The company you know, it has been pretty bungled. I, I think they've frequently be on, been on the list of worst performing companies. So when you look at the management team's history, how do you kind of get comfortable with them doing, you know, another launch that's got yep. tons of upside, but it's going to take a lot of work. So, and, and I think, you know, I'll, I would say a lot of investors have probably lost patience, right. With him as a CEO. Um, and on the point on the rest of the team, I'd have to go back and look, but CFO is definitely different. Like a lot of the management teams refreshed, but besides coffer. So um, I think, you know, you, you got to go, my take is, um, you know, he, he's an engineer, right? Like it was a strategic mistake that they, um, you know, to try and really compete directly against the OTAs when the OTAs were 50% of revenue. Um, at the same, you know, the, the, cause the, the, I think that the, the knock on this idea is always like, well, these guys can't execute. So why are they going to execute any differently this time? I think, you know, if, if they change the CEO, the stock would probably go up tomorrow, right? However, I think that might be misplaced. Like my take is a little bit different. Um, you know, if you step back, 
you gotta ask yourself, like, why is this guy still coming to work, right? So 20 years ago, right, 18 years ago, you know, I don't know how much of the business he owned, but uh, IAC at the time paid a couple hundred million dollars for TripAdvisor. He was a founder. So presumably he could have done whatever he wanted. Right. And yet he continued to work for Barry Diller forever. And now he works, he's been working for Greg Maffei forever. And, you know, he, he's not, presumably he doesn't do that because he needs the paycheck. Right. Like he's, you know, I, you know, if the question is, does this guy love the money or does this guy love the business? I think he actually really loves the business. So that's like, you know, and, and he might be able to, he might love the business, but be terrible at running it. Like, I don't know, you know, that that's, you know, that's a valid concern. But I think the other thing is like, you know, they, you know, that, I mean, look, that was a mistake. Like, uh, you know, the, 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 the instant book and they blew a ton of money on Google clicks that weren't that valuable. Right. I think that was the biggest issue, but they, you know, they, they stopped and they changed and they pivoted to something else. And, and there's no question that they've been dealt a tough hand, right? You look, you mentioned Yelp, you know, you look at sort of the other, you know, group on the other kinds of businesses that sort of compete against, you know, Google effectively for customer, you know, that last click attribution, um, you know, it's, it's tough. And so, you know, that's not his fault. Right. Um, and, and the, and, and while, you know, it's, it's a common critique to say they can't execute, I would actually say, well, if you if you step back and you look at the product, right, and as and you know the you know and as as an engineer, I actually would say it's gotten materially better, right? When you know my old work, we owned this at the spin when it spun out from uh, Expedia like eight nine years ago, and um, you know it, it was pop ups, right? We were in desktop land then, and it was like pop up and is this terrible experience, and then and they transitioned it to you know an inline meta search on desktop, and then an inline meta search on mobile, and then the instant book on mobile, which is arguably from the consumer, you know maybe it's easier if you're a dedicated consumer, and and so you know the. They, they did a very good job rolling out those products that are arguably better products than the one, you know, I think almost unequivocally better products than the ones before. They just couldn't monetize, right? So, um, you know, so I, to me, I, I feel like, I mean, it can't get much worse, right? Like, and so I, I, I and I, and I think, I think this, because of, you know, the, like I said, the industrial logic here, I think, I think there's a real opportunity and, you know, so hopefully we're in the, you know, we're entering a business where, you know, anybody can run it. The, this might be a, a strained analogy. So if it is, you just, you just tell me I'm wrong and we go for it. But, you know, for years, TripAdvisor has been saying, I, I think it's, hey, our reviews are the start of, I think it's a hundred billion dollars of travel spend every year. It's some, it's no, some 2.4 amount. on their most recent slides, 2.4, like a uh, billion. No, uh, it's a lot. It, it's gotta, it's gotta be higher than 2.4, but it's a lot. They say, hey, we, we do, you know, we're the start of 10, a hundred times the spend for actually the revenue that we get. Right. So their, their argument for years has been, if we can just find some way to capture a little bit more of that value we're creating, we're going to go to the moon. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of Twitter where Twitter for years, the, the argument has been, they found this product that's creating so much value for everyone else around them. And they just haven't been able to find the way to really tap into that. I mean, Twitter literally had the power to end the presidency of the, uh, uh, right. to end a presidency. Right. right. And they're, you know, they can barely make any money. And in a similar way, Jack Dorsey, founder, he's been there for a long time, kind of controversial, but he's still running it. I don't think it's because he needs the money. It's the same way to Steve. Right. So right. It, I, I see some parallels, obviously very different, but I, I see a lot of parallels. There. Well, there, you know, the other parallel, I mean, there's two things. You know, the, the analogy breaks down a little in that the problem with travel is always you take one or two or three trips a year, whereas I'm, I'm on Twitter every day. So that's an issue. Um, but, you know, it's an issue for everybody in the industry. So, you know, what can you do? But the other part of the analogy, actually, as you're saying, that makes sense to something we haven't talked about is um, like Greg O'Hara and Sataris uh, at Liberty TripAdvisor. And if, you know, people haven't done work, it's it's willing to do the dive and figure out, like, who is this guy who's now vice chairman of Liberty Tribute Advisor? Like, these are the guys that bailed out um, the Liberty folks last year when they had a margin call. And, you know, they've already, like, tripled their money, right, on, on, the, on the preferred that they did. And then, you know, I mean, he's like a travel industry wizard. Right. And and, you know, his big deal kind of the, the kind of the claim to fame is he after he he had a number of jobs at Sabre and um, other places, then was like, a, 
you know, uh, JP Morgan, I think it was JP Morgan's um, private equity and running kind of like all their travel investment. And then he quit there and did this giant club deal where they took down 50 per him and then like Carlisle and the, I think it was C Cutter, Cutter, Dubai, somebody, um, you know, and they, and they took down 50% of American Express global business travel, right? So that's now, you know, like a 50% JV between this private equity consortium led by Greg O'Hara and, and American Express. And, and just in the same way at Twitter, you've now got, you know, Elliot and um, Silver Lake, you know, really, you know, you know, presumably it's not bad to have them there. And I, I think it, I think it is a similar situation. Perfect. And we're going to talk a little bit more Liberty TripAdvisor in a second, but let's just, let's stick with TripAdvisor and just talk valuation here, right? So yeah. as we're doing, as we're taping this, the stock is trading a little under 40, I call it 37, whatever. I've got it trading at maybe 12 times EV to 2019 adjusted EBITDA. A lot of stock comp is in that adjusted EBITDA number. So yes. you know, there, there, there is a lot of debate on <laughs> how you look at that. But you know, I, I guess the question is just when I'm looking at that 12 times 2019 EBITDA, yeah, we probably have a little mini cycle coming, but it, it doesn't seem crazy cheap on the headline numbers, but doesn't include the TripAdvisor Plus number. So I'll kind of flip all that over to you. How are you looking at the valuation here? Yeah. So, I mean, mostly like what, what is my downside, right? And so if I strip out, um, uh, you know, and, and think about, you know, what is that value of that uh, experiences business, right? Because I don't really care that that thing doesn't generate much in the way of cash flow or EBITDA right now, right? Because it's growing and I think there's a bright future there. And, so, and there's there's real cost to growing it, right? Because again, they have to right. go literally yeah. business by business and yeah. say, plug into our program that it takes real cost on a real sales force. Right. So, so, you know, and we can have debate about what that's worth, but it's worth something. Then you say, um, you know, I, and I, and I think, you know, you, you talked about the stock company. You also got to look at, um, you know, they expense like a lot of guys, Expedia in particular, they expense a lot of, uh, uh, they, they amortize a lot of their like software expenses too. So, so EBITDA is a very slippery slope. I prefer to look at the cash flows of this business, right? And it was, you know, after they kind of you know, repented of their sins um, with, with regards to Instant Book, and they said, we're going to stop, you know, pissing away money on Google, right? This thing started to generate. $350 million of free cash flow a year and like real free cash flow, right? And, and you know, when I think about like, well, what happens if uh, Instant Book doesn't work, right? Um, that's what I'm left with, right? I'm left with this nice asset. And, and sort of, and I think kind of the same business where they're going to run it for cash, they're going to buy back stock, they're going to, uh, you know, maybe paid, you know, they paid a big dividend a while ago. And so, you know, on a free, you know, on a free cash flow basis, it's probably trading like, I don't know, 7% free cash flow yield. If you were to back out the um, experiences business, because it presumably doesn't generate hardly any cash, right? You just said, what is this kind of legacy, very mediocre advertising, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of just free cash flow machine, like what does that thing yield? And, you know, it would be, you know, double digit, right? It would be double digits, right? If, if you were to willing to play those games. So that, that's kind of how I, I, I think about it. Um, on the valuation side, you know, with the upside, like, yeah, you probably should think about like, what's the right EBITDA multiple on a, you know, a billion dollar EBITDA subscription kind of a business. You know, what would that, um, you know, what would that, what would the market garner that, right? And I mean, it's, it could get silly. And then when I mean, you, and then maybe this is the time to transition to Liberty TripAdvisor. Right. We're, we're going to do Liberty TripAdvisor one second. I, I want to agree with you on one point and ask you one more question. I, I mean, I'm with you. That That's one of the things that attracts me. I, I was running the math. I was like, well, if they, you, you know, hundreds of millions of unique users, if they could just get $2 million, $100 per year, you start putting a subscription multiple on that. It gets pretty crazy pretty quickly. And that's before you talk about all the flywheel effects. Last question on TripAdvisor, and then we'll switch over to Liberty Trip. One of the things they've been talking about is they say, hey, we took out more than 200 million in fixed yeah. costs from yeah. 2019 to 2020. And this is just something I've struggled with every company that's gotten hit by COVID and is kind of reopening play. You know, 2019 adjusted EBITDA, so this was after stop comp or before stop comp, was 438 million. And they're saying, hey, we took out over 200 million in fixed, comp, fixed cost expenses. And I look at this and I'm like, I don't think this was. You know, it was a $1.5 billion business in 2019. I don't think they were running around with tons of fat. And I keep looking at them and being like, they say they're going to be able to keep almost all of that fixed cost kind of out when they rebound. But what, 
where what was that fixed cost like two think- hundred number go ahead I, I think you're conflating two things right because i think i think i'd have to go back and look that 200 million includes that some of the ad spend right which they just went away i don't think so because i i think it was the jp morgan conference where they said we took out 200 million in fixed costs and we reduced our variable costs by 200 million because they stopped that ad spend but i could be wrong no i take it back you're probably right i think the um you know I don't doubt there's costs coming back. What I think is really interesting, right? Like the headcount number, this is real, right? Headcount's down 34% year over year, right? So we know they took out a huge slug of headcount. And, and my view is it's because, you know, if you look back into when they hired the people who are running these, um, these subscription businesses, it, it's very unclear to me if this was a COVID decision or they were actually working on this pre-COVID and then it kind of happened. And COVID was sort of this excuse to like, you know what? Let's re-architect the business, right? We can totally change our employee base and and let's point it in this other direction, right? And and because you know, the people who were selling clicks to the OTAs, may, you know, it's probably a different skill set, right? Who's selling, you know, trying to build out inventory with the hotels or whatever. So I think I think you're right. I think there, you know, some of these fixed costs have to come back. But, um, you know, we're starting from, you know, a leaner, cleaner place with a, you know, than, you know, than we would have been otherwise. And so I don't know if that answers your question or that's kind of my take on it. No, it's great. I don't think there's an answer. It's, just, it's, it's something I wanted to ask you. And it's a question I've been having with every COVID reopening play. You know, you see a restaurant and they say, hey, when we come back, our EBITDA margins are going to be 10% higher than they were pre-COVID. And you're like... What restaurants? Yeah, maybe, maybe right? Maybe ahead. for a while. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, how are you guys going? You have to pay someone. Let, you know, let's, there's be, you know before we move, there's one other point that just hasn't come up that I wanted to highlight for people. Is there's a a company in Europe, uh, an online it's a it's publicly traded uh, online travel agency, primarily air focused, called eDreams Odigio, right? And they offer in a bunch of they operate in a bunch of different European markets, and you know, they kind of had the same problem, right? You know, if, if I go back to my hierarchy of like good businesses, like hotels has been the best, you know, air has really sucked, right? Like, premier, you know, particularly in the US where you have five carriers and, you know, everybody books direct, like there's just no commission in it. In Europe, it's a little different because you have all these different countries. Everybody's got kind of a local carrier. So there's like a business there. And that's what e, that's what eDreams is really focused on because booking sort of clean their clock on hotels. But people would go in, in the markets they operate that a decent business in air, but they could never really monetize it, right? Like, like, cause it was, you know, it's just a teeny tiny air commission, not a big chunky hotel commission. And, and then they were paying, you know, like 60% of their revenue in the Google tax, right? So it was just a, t- and, and they, they about two, three years ago landed on this idea of a, we'll just get this wholesale hotel inventory, which is pretty easy to get, you know, you too could go out there and and acquire it and we'll push it through this subscription model. And you should go on their website and like study, you know, they're, they're selling that like this thing, they just hit over a million subscribers um, to their, uh, you know, they've been at it for three years, two and a half, two years, two, three years, uh, but they hit a million subscribers. They say those people book, you know, two times, three times more their, their, um, you know, their, you know, Lifetime value is up multiples on those customers that pay for that that annual subscription, and and you know the thing to to realize here is that company had like ten to twenty million monthly uniques, right? And so they're like you know five percent of TripAdvisor's opportunity, right? And and but and and that that doesn't mean that TripAdvisor you know is going to go straight to you know twenty million uniques, right? Or, or twenty million subscribers. But what, what it does is it, it does validate the subscription model, at least to some extent, right? That there's a certain population, at least in Europe, who, who are interested in this kind of a product, which I find, you know, I think is very helpful. And I don't think eDreams has the, has the experience offering that oh, TripAdvisor no. does. And if you, I, everybody gets really focused on the hotels because that's where the big money saver is, right? You know, five day hotel say probably $750,000. So it could save a lot of money, but I do think experience is actually where the real value could be added, where they could really offer, Hey, you go try to book this escape room anywhere. It's $30. You do it through us. It's 25, just because we're passing a lot of that. Right. They'll give you, if you're behind plus they'll give you, you know, which is TripAdvisor eating into their margin, but they can't, you know? Yeah. yeah. But you know, if the, if the escape room pays them a 30% booking fee, so $9 on a $30 room, TripAdvisor could pass you seven, keep two, and they've got the subscription and they're encouraging you to book through them a lot. It just really works out well. 
I think we got. You know, I mean, I don't want to like. I really, I, you know, I appreciate the 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 bullish sentiment. The the risk is again this idea of resale price maintenance and rate parity. Somebody's got to police it, right? And like you know, historically the OTAs like police it for the small hotels. So you would probably see that. But if I own one escape room, right? Like I might be offering that discount a lot of places, right? Yeah, so, oh, but it's yes, one hundred percent true. But at some point, it, it's going to get difficult because. If you're that person, like, yeah, if somebody calls you directly or books directly with you, you could probably get, give them a wink, wink deal, but you can't advertise it everywhere because then you're just undercutting it. TripAdvisor right. is going to go and say, hey, you have to match us. You've got to pay us. Anyway, unrelated. I just thought that was interesting. We've got about 10 minutes left. Let's turn over. We've talked about TripAdvisor, but I think the way both you and I think is a little more interesting to play is Liberty TripAdvisor. And that story has gotten a little more complicated to value because they got bailed out in the margin loan last year. Yeah. So let's talk about why Liberty TripAdvisor is a better way to play it, how you value it, because I think the financials are a little complicated at this point, all that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, whether or not it's a better way to play it, it, it just depends on your risk profile, right? And, you know, because, you know, there's, you know, a higher risk and a much higher reward. It's just a levered bet on TripAdvisor, right? They own, you know, again, it's sort of, they have a billion dollars in TripAdvisor stock, 1.1 maybe, and, and the control, you could argue whether or not that's worth anything. And then they've got this complicated pile of debt. Um, and so it, you know, it basically means in a big dream scenario, right? Where TripAdvisor is up, you know, you know, many, you know, multiples from here, this is up many, many multiples from here, right? So that's the, that's the reason to do it. Um, uh, you know, if you believe that, but you know, it goes both ways. TripAdvisor, you know, craters 30%, this will be down 50%. So um, um, that, that, you know, at a high level, that's what it is. I mean, I think where, you know, they got caught with their pants down last year, right? Like it was a margin loan. They got a margin call. And, you know, Sataris came in as the white knight and they've been paid handsomely for that. But like, what a great partner. Like you couldn't, it's not like they just got the schlocky, you know, kind of first dollars they could get their hands on. Like, this is a great partner to have, um, you know, so, you know, I, you know, fortunately we weren't invested in Liberty True Advisor at the time. Uh, but like when they came on, it's, a, it's, you know, I'm very excited to be partnered with them along with the Liberty guys. Would I and, be, would I be crazy to say that it is not a coincidence that instant or sorry, that TripAdvisor Plus, the subscription product, came out after Satari's kind of got involved. I don't know. I, I asked the company that question. Like, I don't know. Nobody will really cop to it. Like I, I said before, you know, you can see like some of the folks running when they were hired. Like, I mean, you'd think the Liberty guys have been talking about subscription business forever, right? Like, why can't you turn this into like, so I, I don't know the answer to that. But I mean, clearly, when you think about, you know, what is that American Express global business travel business? Like, what's one of the things they offer is... I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on that business, but they negotiate corporate rates, right? With hotels. And then they pass them through in this closed system. So, I mean, you can see why it's attractive for Sataris and why they, you know, they, they've taken, they've basically taken their bait back, uh, you know, kind of with the refinancing that happened uh, a month or two ago, uh, not the refinancing, but where um, TripAdvisor, uh, Liberty TripAdvisor bought, they bought back 40% of the preferred um, but then, you know, the rest is going to ride. Like they don't, um, you know, I mean, they have the right to sell it, but they no longer have the right to put it. So, um, uh, so, it, you know, it appears, and if you listen to kind of how they, Sataris operates, it, you know, it looks like they, they're in here for a while, which I think is positive. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you're saying. So, you know, I think, so we've talked about Sertari's impact. We've talked about TripAdvisor's, uh, sorry, Liberty TripAdvisor's leverage, but let's just break it out for people. You know, as we talk again, sure. Trip, TripAdvisor's trading around 40, a little bit below 40. Liberty TripAdvisor's trading around 360, 370. So, you know, in a bull case, let's say TripAdvisor knocks it out of the park with TripAdvisor Plus. I mean, I think the stock could it, it could run to crazy multiples. You so give me the number time. and I'll tell you what I think it would be worth. Let, let's say, let's say TripAdvisor shares go to a hundred. What is Liberty TripAdvisor worth? So, and you have to, if you're building your models, you got to remember it. So there's the Satari's preferred participates at 80% of the upside over 17 bucks. So you got to build that in. And then they sold, um, there's a, there's a, a variable prepaid forward that will tax some of the upside. And then there's also, they sold this exchangeable 
that is a draw after about 70 bucks, that starts to be a tax on the upside. So if you build all those things in, you know, I could be wrong, but you know, I think I'm right here, you know, at that point, you know, the nav would be like 21 bucks a share, 22 bucks a share for Liberty Trip Advisor, and then whether or not it trades at a discount or not, um, you know, you'd have to back that off. But so the rough math here is if TripAdvisor is a three is a 3x, which it, it could be more than that if the subscription product really got rolling. But if it's a 3x. Well, and we're talking over, this isn't going to happen overnight, right? Like this yes, be yes, yes, yes. It'll years. be over time. But if TripAdvisor is a 3x over, let's call it the next three years or something, right? Then Liberty TripAdvisor, NAV could go to 21. It's a $3, 360. So this could be a four or 5x it, it, right. it win TripAdvisor. Right. Probably think about it as sort of double whatever TripAdvisor does, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Cool. Well, we are approaching the hour mark. Oh, I did have one last question. And I, I actually do think it's an important one. I do think there is an argument that both TripAdvisor and Liberty TripAdvisor right now have what I'm going to call a Maffei discount, right? Yeah. Because Maffei, there is no doubt about it. We've talked about how Liberty TripAdvisor had to get bailed out. Down 90%, right? Yeah, kind of twice, right? Because first they had to get a little bit of bailout when they forced TripAdvisor to pay a dividend in, I think it was late 2018 or maybe 2019. Yeah. Then they had to get bailed out again when the crisis happened. And you know what? The crisis is very unique, but obviously they mismanaged the capital structure. They had to get bailed out, as you said, down 90%. So there's that. They mismanaged the Formula One capital structure and Formula One and Liberty Series had to do all of these weird things to kind of bail out the Formula One and especially the live nation stake. So- I think there could be an argument that there is a Maffei discount applied to this because what has he done? What has he kind of done for you lately? Over the past five years, they made a great investment in charter, but what is what can you really point to Maffei doing? So I think there's a discount there, and I just wanted you to riff on that for a second. Uh, I, I don't disagree. I mean, if you look at where you know this thing used to trade, uh, uh, you know, if you track the discount to NAV, it was basically it traded a NAV sometimes at a premium, right? There were times it traded. 1.2 times nav or 1.1 times nav so Which makes sense because levered upside plus they have this super voting controlling chair so it, right. it kind of would make sense to trade at a premium well you know if you know but it's really only worth a premium probably if somebody wants to buy it right um so uh you know i i don't really disagree i mean i think you know i, I don't think we should shed tears for people who lost money investing with the liberty guys no you know and, and you know because that's, you know, you pick up both ends of the stick, right? Like, you know, it's complex and you know, they put a lot of leverage on it and they have a portfolio and, you know, the portfolio has done pretty well, but this is, you know, not their sh most finest moment. That's for sure. That's perfect. That's perfect. We've talked about a lot. It's been about an hour. I just want to make sure, is there anything else? Liberty TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor, anything you think we should have covered that you kind of wish we, we had talked about? Uh, nope. I think we got the, I think we got the high points. All right. Well, then, look, Adam, this is a great idea. I, I'm really interested in it. I thought you did a great job laying out the TripAdvisor Plus thing. You know, again, this, this has multi-bagger potential and Liberty TripAdvisor would then have multi-multi-bagger potential. So super interesting idea. I appreciate you coming on. We might have to do another one in Discovery again because I know we've got a, a mutual interest there and yeah. there's a couple other ones. But appreciate you coming on and we'll have to chat again soon. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it.